I'm David Levi Strauss, Chair of the MFA Program in Art Criticism and Writing here at the School of Visual Arts. Welcome to the Quixote Talks. Um, I'm hoping that some of you will uh, join us as well here on Saturday for our annual Graduate Student Conference Critical Information with a full day of panels. Uh, starts at 10, 10 a.m. and then at 4 there'll be a keynote address by Boris Groys. Uh, and this whole conference was put together by our second year students. Um, we are very pleased to have Miriam Nichols with us tonight. Her appearance here in New York all the way from Vancouver is co-sponsored by the Center for the Humanities at CUNY and many thanks to Amiel Alcalé for making that possible. Um, Miriam's going to appear tomorrow, Friday at 4 p.m. in the English Department Lounge on the fourth floor yep. uh, at CUNY uh, with Amiel and the Lost and Found editors to talk about editing archival materials, Robin Blazer's Astonishment Tapes. And it's open to the public. It yeah. is, yeah, free. Um, I first knew about Miriam Nichols as one of the organizers of an amazing gathering in honor of the great poet Robin Blazer in Vancouver in 1995. It was called The Recovery of the Public World. She then went on to edit a volume of essays, readings, and archival materials on the poetry and poetics of Blazer called Even on Sunday in 2002. Yes. Uh, and then edited his <laughs> and then edited his collected poems, the Holy Forest, and the collected essays, the Fire, both indispensable works. Her book of essays, Radical Affections, Essays on the Practice of Outside, appeared in 2011, focusing on the poets Charles Olson, Robert Creeley, Robert Duncan, Jack Spicer, Robin Blazer, and Susan Howe. More recently, she has prepared an edition of Blazer's The Astonishment Tapes, forthcoming from Alabama yeah, University. Yeah, it it's actually the proofs are on my hard drive right now, <laughs> waiting <laughs> till I get back from New York. <laughs> uh, do you know when, it, when will it be? It should be out in spring. They're advertising it already, and they've given me you know, dire deadlines. This must be done by the 27th of December. That must mean it's going to happen. So it'll come back for indexing, but you know, it's, it'll, it should be out by spring. Great. Yeah. And she's currently working on a literary biography of Robin Blazer. Yeah. Tonight she's going to talk about mythopoesis in Charles Olson's later Maximus poems, <coughs> The Importance of the Beautiful. Please welcome Mary Nichols. I didn't know that you dug up even on Sunday. That book is impossible to find. <laughs> Okay, so no, stuck here. So um, I have a certain passion for unpopular subjects, and that's why I like to write about the beautiful and the mythopoeisis and stuff like that. So um, that's the real impulse behind. And you can stop me at any point and ask questions if you want to. Okay, so that would be nice to have a conversation. Otherwise, we'll. Get started. Okay, so um, this is going to be on volume three of the Maximus poems, but it's going to take me a little while to get there. I need a little detour. Um, why volume three? Well, it's problematic for some readers because it, I think it includes a stronger mythopoetic content. Um, kind of, I know it's a, it's a generalization, but you know, readers tend to think, oh, the history poems in the first vo Ma Maximus volume one, and then he got all mythical on us, right? And so those last poems are a little bit problematic, a little bit beyond the pale. I'd like to discuss what I think to be the aim of the mythopoeisis, and more particularly the significance of the beautiful in Olson's writing. Much contemporary literary criticism and theoretical writing assumes sociological or ethical perspectives. That is, it reaches for the good or the useful in a work of art. This would include um, deconstruction and its derivatives insofar as these are inscribed within the metaphysical tradition, feminism, post-colonial theory, Marxism, 
and even some of the newer psychologically based affect theories like Martha Nussbaum's. In fact, all theories that take as given that the critical task is to expose the invested nature of artistic vision. Without denigration to these discourses and without denying that perception is situated, I propose that Olson's art becomes much richer and more <coughs> suggestive of present possibilities for poetry if it is read as attention to the beautiful rather than the good or the useful. Right. I'm using Kantian categories, of course. The broadest aim of the Maximus poems is to make a world appear as form, so that humanity can gain a sense of its species self as positioned in something larger and other. To get at why this matters, I will begin by restating what I think constitutes Olson's project as it begins in Call Me Ishmael. I will then take up the beautiful, uh, the ascetic dimension in the later Maximus poems through a discussion of Olson's revisionary understanding of what constitutes a thing in his objectism. And from there, I will show how the beautiful leads back to a refreshed understanding of the good and useful. The wager of Olson's work is an adequate response to the cosmos' as beauty, or as I would like to call it, the open whole, will bear indirectly on the mundane social world and its discontent. So that's the introduction. And then I have this section on the project, which is really um, about Call Me Ishmael. Two major recognitions in Call Me Ishmael. The first is Ahabian man, okay? Humanity from Socrates to Melville, um, Olson says, has lost the familiarity of its own material ground in mighty nature. Without this ground and in the absence of a credible metaphysics, man writ large is all there is. Um, I leave the noun masculine to indicate the male-centeredness of the tradition that Olson references. <coughs> Ahab cannot have a world because he considers himself to be a world. Evidence to the contrary, he greets with fanatical rage. He cannot tolerate the idea that he does not own himself from the ground up that there is something out there that resists the use he would make of it, the understanding he might gain of it, or the moral law he would impose on it. For Ahabian man, the only thing that can be done about a resisting otherness out there is to dominate or kill it. Hence nature in any guise, other than its use to humanity, that is the whale as commodity, or a sign of human value, the whale as an emblem of good or evil, is there to be destroyed. Ahab is an early instance of what Olson would later call mouth without the world to eat. It is to the point that Call Me Ishmael begins with a story of cannibalism through Olson's recounting of the true story of the Essex. Cast adrift after the wreck of their vessel, the surviving crew members are reduced to turning each other into food. In the act of cannibalism, they pass out of their humanity and into manifestations of mouth. The um, fact uh, that the fact that everything feeds on everything else. I do not mean to imply criticism of behavior drawn out of extremity, nor do I think did Olson. The point <coughs> is rather that in this instance of maximum reduction, mouth becomes visible as a shared element of species life. We can then better see the operations of it in the social world of Ahab, where mouth is contingent rather than necessary. Through his instrumentalizing of the crew, and his binding of their wildly different minds to his one megalomaniacal idea. Ahab devours his crew metaphorically as the men of the Essex devour each other literally, and for this he is answerable as they are not. In the resistance, Olson links the reduction of bodies to raw materials in fascist concentration camps with the habits of mind made possible by what he calls the intolerable way of the metaphysical tradition. In the human universe, he lays these generalizing habits of mind at the feet of Socrates and Plato. In a sweeping periodization, Olson dates the universe of discourse, or the rhetoric of Platonic abstraction from 450 BC to his own time at mid 20th century. <clears throat> I'm not going to argue for or against Olson's reading of Plato. Plato is arguably his straw man. The point is that whoever we blame for it, discourse, as Sultan defines it, comes at the expense of full content. 
If it is complete and enduring knowledge of something that we are after, then we have to abstract entities from their spatial and temporal context and equate them with their generic qualities. <coughs> In other words, we have to treat the creatures and things of the world at a level of abstraction higher than the embodied and historical. It is at the embodied level that the particularity of the thing manifests. This is a point to be gleaned from Melville's many meditations on the nature of the whale, in which Ishmael comes to think that it will never be possible to know a whale because one can never perceive the creature in its entirety all at once. And there's a really marvelous chapter in Moby Dick where Ishmael is down in the belly of the whale and, and, and all the crew member, members are collecting blubber and spermaceti and, and he's saying, well, you know, um, here I am and this is the whale from the inside, you know, but um, it's not actually the whale from the outside and I can't be inside and outside at the same time and if, then if I could, I could only see one side of it at a time and then if I could see that side, then of course I couldn't really see it underwater because part of it is, and he ends with the, cha with the chapter saying I couldn't really, s I could never really get the whole of the whale at all. It's a really wonderful uh, little meditation on particularities. Okay, um, Ishmael poses perception against abstract knowledge, and this is a distinction that Olson works hard to establish in the human universe and the special view of history, where history becomes istor in our story, and myth becomes muthos, or what is said. The universe of discourse, in contrast to the stories one tells from experience, is a world of concepts that can be manipulated without an accounting of the actualities they are used to push around in the world, language as instrument versus language as exploration. Olson says in Human Universe that any concrete thing is a danger to rhetoricians and politicians as dangerous as hard coin is to a banker. The concrete or actual occasion will impede the manipulation of concepts because the content of it will both exceed and fall short of the concept. For example, the word chair can never hold on to the details of an actual sitting device, just as said device can never embody all possibilities of a concept. With the death of God, God is the only guarantor of the value and truth of the rationalism backing the circulation of concepts. Humanity is thrown back on its discourses which it then takes to be the only reality. Critically speaking, anything other to that discourse is onto theology and therefore an epistemological error. The result is Ahabian man, worldless and unaware of its own ravenous bottom nature as mouth. The critical intellect can deconstruct the universe of discourse, of course, but then it can deconstruct any kind of discourse at all. And certainly Olson's, <clears throat> we are left with no way to imagine ourselves or our world, no way to talk about what is not ourselves, and no way to usefully distinguish between different kinds of language use. The second significant recognition that Olson makes in Call Me Ishmael is that reality is process. Of course, this recognition is everywhere in the poems and essays, and Olson works through it with a lifelong meditation on Whitehead, as well as the layman's interest in physics. Call Me Ishmael, however, shows that a dynamic, temporal, atomic world is not simply a benign alternative to platonic forms. Again, the story of cannibalism serves because it shows that there is no ontological privilege in the becoming of the world. In extremity or death, humanity descends to the meat, like all other organisms. Everything feeds. This state of affairs requires a quest for stance, where stance implies value. Some men ride on space, others have to fasten themselves like a tent stake, <coughs> Olson writes in Ishmael. In other words, how to accommodate process in such a way as to construct an actual earth of value. How to make form adequate to the dynamism of nature and yet acknowledge at the same time the human need for order, measure, and ethos. In Equal That Is to the Real Itself, Olson describes a topology that is continuous rather than discrete. Again, the implications ripple out through his work. Discrete forms give way to the Mobius strip. That's my best metaphor for Olson's work, the twisting of inside and outside. And I think that is common to a lot of poets and painters and writers at that time. Um, where was I? Mm. 
So the Mobius strip, suggesting an end to the boundary ego-centered self as a unit separable from its worldly context. The relationship between human and non-human, self and other, then becomes neither separate from nor reducible to. Art also has to become kinetic, Olson thinks. It can't describe because the energy of the actual will be lost in the abstraction of description. It has to perform the world by analogy. Form, insofar as it closes on itself, will delete content. Art then has to reenact. It is, as Olson has it in the human universe, life's twin. Hence, composition by field as a way of juxtaposing the things of perception in such a way that they can extend themselves as vectors. The elements of the poem have to be posed so that they can unfurl in a manner that would not be possible if it were pinned too tidily into closure. From these recognitions, Olson works toward a human universe alternative to that of Ahabian man. So those are basically the two points, right? You have Ahabian man that has gotten rid of God and therefore reduces the world to itself and its own perceptions. And then how do you get around that, right? Well, process. Uh, the human relationship to physical nature is primary. If humanity is to be repositioned as one species among others, then it will have to take on the status of an object among others. At the same time, the old idea of an object as a static substance has to be revised. In projective verse, objectism means getting rid of the ego-centered self, the lyrical interference of the individual's ego, in favor of a thing of flowing boundaries, a thing redefined, in other words. Olson's emphasis on experience, uh, or Hesiod rather than Thucydides, then follows as a kind of mental discipline, an effort to bring the elusiveness of actuality to bear on the human way of being in the world, as a check and balance to the abstraction that is always already there in language. Olson's interest in the concrete is not, so I'm laboring this. I know it's kind of, the language is sort of turgid, but I'm, <laughs> I'm laboring it to try to get around the epistemological problem that is present in trying to find an alternative to um, a theological vision of the universe. Huh? Um, so I claim that Olson's interest in the concrete is not the epistemological naivety it has sometimes been taken to be that is the posing of perception as unmediated, but rather a strategy to hold open concepts of things to the heterogeneity and temporality of their content. In the special view, Olson suggests that the Hegelian dialectic be interrupted with Keats's negative capability. For Hegel synthesizes, Olson would hold steady in the process, an unending interchange of inner and outer, subject and object, as these are understood to be positions in the field of the real and not discrete entities. So in a way, I'm describing composition by field. I'm describing Whiteheadian metaphysics here in just slightly different language. For folks who were here last night, I'm saying the same thing in a different way, right? This is composition by field, right? You have figures coming out of the field that are, not, that are, that are neither reducible to nor equivalent to their, to their ground, right? And that is the Olsonian alternative to skepticism on one hand and metaphysics on the other. Um, okay, so um, the next section is on objectism. Uh, it's called The New Thing. Mm -hmm. um, and I start with Judith Held and Sullivan's book, The Topology of Being, um, which is a Heideggerian reading of Olson dating from 1991. Mm -hmm. The book quickly disappeared from critical attention because I think the theoretical climate of the times is hostile to both Olson and Heidegger. I want to return to her reading because it brings out two elements of Olson's poetics that illuminate the later poems, that is totality and disclosure. Both of these words have fallen, as Heidegger might say, into forgetting. We think of totality in relation to totalitarianism and closed form, a reductive didacticism of the intellect. But it has another sense as the open whole or evolving cos cosmos. At the perceptual level, Heldon Sullivan says, a totality embraces all the things and the environment exterior to the human being. As an explication of being, it suggests the wholeness that depends upon the meaningful interrelationships between human and things. From Whitehead and modern physics, Olson took the idea that every actual entity of the universe is related to every other, although with different 
degrees of intensity. This is a view of the universe as alive and charged with affect. Whitehead defines actual entities as droplets of experience or living processes rather than substances. It is Heidegger's language, though, that suggests the idea of the thing as unceasing disclosure and cosmic assemblage. In his essay on the thing in poetry language thought, um, the Heideggerian essay uh, called The Thing, the jug reveals itself as that which stands for, that which can be faced and which therefore can assemble a space. As Heidegger mediate, uh, meditates on it, the jug becomes a gathering of earth, sky, mortals and gods. Earth and sky swell in the gift of the outpouring. In the gift of the outpouring earth and sky, divinities and mortals dwell together all at once. That's his language. Fully considered, things are events that assemble the play of the world as revealing concealing. This is the play that Heidegger identifies with Alethea, and I would like to hyphenate Alethea to get the idea of unforgetting. Um, so really, what I wanted to take, I could do this through Whitehead and probably raise less hackles than through Heidegger. Um, but <clears throat> what I wanted was the language of light, because in the later Maximus poems, the light just streams. Eh? as the space of assemblage, where the world assembles. I wanted that concept out of poetry, language, and thought. Um, the space of assemblage in which the reciprocally related shows itself yeah, is, is primordial rather than the social. It doesn't resolve incommensurabilities, but situates them in a common light. Um, and that's, I would say, in Olson's later poems, the metaphor of the war flower, right? the whole Cosmos is a seething of things. Okay. Um, uh, another point of intersection with Heidegger is uh, concealment that is intrinsic to the process of self manifestation. For Olson, this would mean the negative capability, hmm? the capacity to stay with the thing in its unfurling without seeking closure. So, this section, as he says, uh, it, it's Trying to, I'm trying to revise the concept of the thing, of thingness, huh? to get it to be both a revealing and concealing, to get to get the idea of process into into thingness, and to get the notion that no thing is ever totally there at, all at once for the intellect. Um, so, like Olson's whale, uh, uh, Melville's whale, the thing is impossible to own as an object of knowledge. So you have to practice the negative capability. The language of light, especially as it comes through Heidegger, has been for many decades deconstructed or set aside. Under the rubric of the ethical or social discourses, totality and disclosure are mystifications unmindful of social differences and concealing onto theologies of thought, heliocentricity, so to say. I take this as, I take this as suspicion of perceptual experience because the mind is situated and not to be trusted, the only compelling truth it can achieve is the laying bare of its own devices. Um, and this is where I'm going back to the introduction to say, really, um, I think to read Olson most productively, you need to get around a lot of the critical vocabularies that are floating around out there. But is this not a barren truth? That is the constant laying bare of devices. No picture of the world can stand up to the critical intellect. And a picture we must have and do have, if only by default. And when we negate the picture, are we not by default still bound to Ahab, which is to say the world in which the human is all? Anthropomorphism may be inevitable. Anthropocentrism is not. In considering Olson's objectism as an alternative to the universe of discourse. The question is not whether experience is true or false, it is neither, or whether or not it is mediated, it is, but whether it is more generative of human possibility than the metaphysical tradition on one hand or its negation on the other. So um, here are some snippets from volume three, the poems um, that stream with light. So this piece, imbued with light, the flower grows down, the air of heaven. Or this one, over the city, over the earth, the earth is the mundus, brown red is the color of the brilliance of earth, the earth shines. Or this one, 
The whole thing has run so fast it breaks my heart. Winter's brilliance with the sun new made from living south, I also re-arisen. Or this one, golden life, golden light on western harbor, out my west window at least 35 minutes after sunset. The whole full landscape of Buddhist message, Olson writes in another. In the Kingfishers, he had turned to the rocks and minerals of the earth in rejecting <coughs> l'ancien regime, he accused Pound of championing. By Maximus, volume three, he finds the stones have become living events and passages, so that the thing begins to flow. They have become the Tao that he has sought at the beginning of his writing life. The salt and minerals of the <coughs> earth return, and Yalian arises from the froth of ocean, the master of Tripura, the war and beauty of the world of man, of the living world. In Yalian, one of the recurrent mythical figures of the later two volumes is a Cretan war god. Olson sometimes conflates him with Mars, Hephaestus, and in these lines with Venus herself, who rises from the sea. The other component of the passage is from Hindu myth. Um, Tripura is another name for the three towns, or world as Maya, under the sway of demons. In Heinrich Zimmer's Myths and Symbols in Indian Art and Civilization, which was one of Olson's sources, the three towns are destroyed by the shot of a single, bow, uh, single arrow from the bow of Shiva. This is a myth that Olson returns, turns to repeatedly because it is analogous to his own project. The end of an epoch dominated by the old humanism and the commencement of a new human universe. In the above lines, in Yalian Venus is the world in its perpetual presencing, its self-revealing as beauty. Olsen associates in Yalian with an Imago Mundi in his cosmology, commenting, um, Stephen Fredman writes, in Yalian becomes the figure of Maximus's recognition of the god who reveals his shining skin, presents himself as a vulnerable, shimmering membrane, a living hieroglyphic to the world. In my view, the many visionary moments of the later Maximus poems are Olson's response to the challenge of Call Me Ishmael, how to respond to mouth without the world to eat, the cannibalistic becoming of things that the metaphysical tradition had tried so hard to contain. The chronology of the cosmos out of Hesiod in the poem beginning to my Portuguese holds the story. Hunger or chaos is first, then earth and Tartarus and then love. Out of raw becoming, earth rises up like Venus from the genital wave, from, up from the poem, The Ring of, uh, with Tartarus inside her, the concealing womb. When earth so shows herself, then love can be born in all other things. Love happens when mouth has a world to respond to. By choosing to address the world rather than simply consume it, mouth becomes muthos, the saying of the world as beauty rather than the consumption of it as fodder for inexhaustible hunger. The whole effort of Olson's poetry then is to present a world for mouth to respond to. As he says in the letter to Elaine Feinstein, you do love or go down. And I take the remark quite literally, either we do respond to the world in such a way as to let it and ourselves stand forth in its thingness, or we go down to the worldlessness of hunger and our own anthropocentrism to consume the planet and ourselves with it. In other words, we go down like Ahab. Hindu myth again sustains Olson's point. Zimmer recounts the story of a lion-headed demon who incarnates the destructive wrath of Shiva. The demon is hunger with nothing to eat, and so Shiva suggests that it feed on itself. In Zimmer's words, the monster, having devoured not only its feet and hands, but its arms and legs as well, was unable to stop. The teeth went on through its own belly and chest and neck until only the face remained. Countering this terrible reflexivity, the mind gnawing itself, nature eating itself, is the world as play of presence and absence. For absence, Tartarus in Olson's, Olson's mythology, or the Lethe in the Heideggerian word Alethea, is stitched into the system as that which withdraws from presence so that it cannot be reduced to the meat or possessed by the mind as an extension of itself. In other words, it can't be gobbled up. 
absence, we could call it process, lets the world appear in its liveness as something other than me. Typhon in Olson's mythology, I looked up and saw its truth through everything, sewn in and binding each scene. That little thing comes again and again in the later Maximus poems. It's like this vision of Typhon, you know, the monster, the latest born of the monsters in Hesiod, and this great serpent thing. And it's a kind of, it, it, the thing, it's, a, it's a hero. In Olson's poem, Typhon is a hero because it brings a kind of uh, energy and worldliness into, right into the Gloucester Harbor. <laughs> In a very late poem, which Maximus, when Maximus is far into the diagram, he becomes simply a conduit for the instance of its voice, that is, the universe. I live underneath the light of day, he says, I am a stone or the ground beneath. My life is buried with all sorts of passages, both on the sides and on the face, turned down to the earth, or built out as long, gifted, generous, northeastern Connecticut stone walls are through which 18th century roads still pass as though they themselves were realms. What or who speaks in this passage? The voice identifies itself with the stone, that mute, impermeable thing, but the stone opens into passages and from there to a demarcation of a geographical and historical space, the walls that mark the paths of 18th century roads geography, history, and geology come together through the voicings of the poet who has become a thing that gathers. The manifesto statement of projective verse that a man is himself an object, whatever he may take to be his advantages, is here realized as is Olson's hunt among the stones in the Kingfishers. In the verses that follow, the stones move the poet into geological time toward primordial creation. The stones they're made up of are from the bottom such ice age megaliths and the uplands, the walls, are the boundaries of, are defined with such non-niggardly definition of the amount of distance between a road in and out of the woodlots or further passageways, further farms are given that one suddenly is walking in Tartarian, Erosian, Gaean, Uranian time and life, love, space, time, and exact analogy, time and intellect, time and mind, time and time, spirit, the initiation of another kind of nation. In the turns of these verses is a restatement of poetics as well as cosmic assemblage. The as fences articulate space, these stone passages call forth the planet and the human universe in history and myth, Tartarus or concealment, and eros or procreative energy begin the primordial play from which all else comes, earth and sky, forests and farms, life, love, space. The last lines of the poem recapitulate Olson's method, time and exact analogy. The poem reenacts the kinetics of life presencing itself, art is life's twin, and it resituates the intellect and spirit on their physical ground in the body, on the earth, in time, and underneath the light of day. So it's all those prepositions. Okay, and just another couple of things in the end here. The gift of the beautiful. <coughs> From the beginning of his life in poetry, Olson had been thinking at the level of the species and the planet rather than the social. In fact, he expresses hostility to sociological thought at several points in the essays and poems. For example, as he writes in a bibliography for Ed Dorn under assumptions that sociology without exception is a lot of shit produced by people who are the most dead of all. History is politics or economics, each being at least events and laws, not this dreadful beast, some average and statistic. Or in the New Empire, he remarks, as though sociology wasn't as chewed as Homer, Homer's Barrett's, that is, cigar. The very particularity of a well-gummed cigar dramatizes the poetic alternative to sociological thinking. The reason for the hostility to the social sciences is not far to find. For Olson, sociology is a study of statistics, trends, large groups, abstractions in short, belonging to the universe of discourse. It emphasizes the determination of the individual and predictability, uh, it emphasizes the determination of the individual and predictability 
in human affairs, this latter a foreclosure of the future from Olson's perspective. Poetry, on the other hand, is the gold machine, an alchemical trope that Olson turns to repeatedly in the last two volumes that makes actual things rise up as concretely in situ as possible, thus the trouble generic representation. So I'm back to my introduction. The world is form or the beautiful. And be I just mean beauty in a really, um, in kind of an abstract way as form, as, as shape. Um, to throw the disturbance of actuality into the universe of discourse. Certainly when mouth utters muthos, it is anthropomorphizing and the sociologists would say mystifying. But anthropomorphizing is an inevitable limit of the human universe. Anthropocentrism is not. This is Olson's implicit recognition of epistemology. What myth does do that rationalist forms of the anthropomorphic do not, is to give the entities of the world, human and non-human, their independent agency. This is the courtesy of myth. It also emphasizes the agency within the limits of what Heidegger would call throneness. Agency, Olson su suggests, comes out of limit. In a special view, he defines it as the confluence of biosocial heritage, chance, and circumstance, or proximity. What matters is not that there are limits, but what we do about them. And what is the prison, the soul says, you shall stay in. It is none my island has taught me. So, to make the pro world appear again in its living thingness as something that can be faced and related to is the work of poetry. I think that's what he feels is specific to poetry as opposed to different other kinds of discourses like sociology or politics or theory or anything else. It's one of its distinguishing marks. I think this is where Olson leaves us at the end of the Maximus poems. It is not the direct political content of the early poems that defines the polis, nor is it even resistance to particular kinds of language use. The negative in Olson to repeat is coiled to the system as its dynamism. Tartarus is his mythical version of the unsayable, and Typhon, the thing, in the Lacanian sense, keeps the form alive and moving and open. More prosaically, the kinetics of composition by field do the work of prizing open the idea to the heterogeneity and temporality of the content that idea assembles. In proprioception, Olson writes that, the pro that process in reality redeems all idealism from theocracy or mobocracy whether it is rational or superstitious, whether it is democratic or socialism. This is Olson's wager, that process will redeem experience from closing into fixed form or dogma. The world as it appears in the poems, a multidimensional confluence of geography, history, geology, personal narrative, dream, the whole of the inner and outer life as Olson can come by it, offers itself as an image of life on earth and an allegory of the richness there to be seen by whoever has eyes for it, Paulus's eyes. I take it that the wager of Olson's poetry is that the beautiful, because it decenters so radically, implies a transformation of the good and the useful, in the sense that the open whole, rather than so sociality, serves to refocus the human ethos. I use the word beauty in a broad sense to mean form or appearance, the world as war flower and cosmic assemblage. Beauty calls for love as its response. To repeat, Inyalian disrobes for any woman who goes by and sees him there and sends her maid to ask if he will show himself. That's from later Maximus poems. In a poem for those poets whose mental level does permit them to know order, Olson puts down for participation more mystique, that love be made known. Those are all quotations, the operative phrases there. The making known of love is another way to read the Maximus poems, as in I, Maximus, one loves only form. But the love of form demands true attention to the density, dynamism, and complexity of things, and it requires that humanity decenter itself on the planet. I take it that this is the religious element in Olson's thinking, this intense imagining of otherness. This poet's love cannot ground itself in any reason, nor does it come with the power to oblige in any way that contemporary societies can recognize as counting. One may simply not see the beautiful as Immanuel Kant recognized, or one may not care. The mental attitude that Olson calls for is not a binding imperative. 
If we go there with him, however, what counts for good and useful might change. The cosmic assemblage is not only about our social differences, however finely drawn and important the latter may be. It is about facing the world as beauty rather than gobbling it up as instrumentally useful or accepting the non-human from ethical consideration. Seeing the world as Enyalian or Venus rising then demands love and praise. Um, and I have a little addendum that I've added called Olson Now. Much has changed since Olson's death in 1970. The technology is faster and the reach of it longer, although our use of it is no wiser. Technology has made the body and its placement on the earth seem less important in the context of virtual time space and the becoming cyborg of the human universe. Even the limits of death have been pushed back a little for the citizens of wealthier countries. But technology and the economic changes it has made possible have extended the human reach at the price of suffering. I am thinking of the disenfranchisements of globalization, climate change, and the destructive pressure of population increase and speeded up resource extraction has had on many non-human species. I am haunted, for instance, by Leslie Silko's terrible dystopian vision of an earth sucked dry for the benefit of an off-planet refuge for the wealthy, an almanac of the dead. Echopoetics in the arts and the discourses of the ecological sciences address this contemporary state of affairs, and they suggest one direction for the humanities, anticipated by Olson's concern with emplacement and decentering the human. The task of finding images for religious feeling, a feeling I understand as respect for planetary otherness rather than superstition or dogma, is ongoing and, I think, has to be undertaken by every generation. Olson turned to the archaic, often through mythology, in order to find a language to make the cosmos appear in its otherness. Yet the old gods have fallen out of belief, as if the earth could not answer to those names. And calling on them has been further complicated by the many cultural histories now circulating on the global stage. Another issue, and it is always buried in the reproach that the arts fiddle while Rome burns, is mouth. Necessity is the more abstract name for it, and as Olson's retelling of the Essex story implies, the regime of necessity is that of instrumentality. Mouth is the incontournable, against which nothing avails and nothing can be said. The triumph of life, Shelley called it. Contemporary societies given over to consumption and market exigencies dwell under this regime, however lush or lean the pickings, and so do the discourses that criticize them. It is the regime, however, that the arts might contest. Under necessity, poetry cannot not appear as decoration or self-expression or impotent harpy complaining from the sidelines about current affairs that can't change. In effect, it disappears. In my view, the real radicalism that the arts are capable of is insistence on a different regime, one based on relational complexity and the open whole, rather than the satisfaction of need. This, that is the regime that I think Olson summoned when he called on the human universe, the one in which mouth leaves off chewing for a moment in order to say something. I think of Robin Blazer's uh, translation of Nerval's Verdor, and I wanted to end with this even though it's, this is strictly an Olson paper, just because of these first lines, everything is alive, from Pythagoras, that's the epigraph, and then, he, and then it starts like this, free of the dead, what can be thought seems to be yours in this world where it all coheres, like you get rid of God and get rid of the dead, and then it's just us, and we can do what we want, right? Is yours in this world where it all coheres, free to spend some powers, but the universe is absent from all your plans. Take the ghost stirring in an animal, each flower, piece of light, scattering love's mystery, asleep in metal, alive, the coherence takes power over you. In the blind wall, you fear the blindness which sees you, even to matter. Put to true and false uses, a word is tied. Often, a secret God exists in the darkness, and like an eye born with the lids closed, a real ghost comes to be under the surface of the stones. That's it.
PowerPoint, huh? That language is really turgid. Is it too turgid? Is it really good? No. Yeah? Okay, good. <laughs> no. Beautiful. Wow. Wow. <laughs> Questions? Opposition? <laughs> Resistance? <laughs> can I actually be just, can I ask you to go back to the Hesiod stuff for a second? Because I got lost. Mm with the mouth and I just really want yeah, to Yeah, it's like, okay, so this is the beginning of Hesiod's Theogony. Huh? Just finished teaching that. So I can be, so the, there's um, the, 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 really, if, if you, it, it, the abstraction, you know, it's time and space that comes first. But in the order in which he's got it is that chaos is first, right? And then there's earth, and earth is place on which to stand. So it's chaos, and earth, and then, what is it, love? No, love is... Eris, Eris. Eros, right, Eris. Eris. And, wait, 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 I've got it. I should know this inside out and backwards. It's, there's four. There's four of them. Um, and really, they're time and space. Love is, love is, think, it's, love is the last four, it, it's last of the four, isn't it? It's, it's chaos, gaia, and is Tartarus Uranus now? Tar Tartarus, well, Tartarus is, yeah, Tartarus, hang on, hang on, hang on. I've got it here. Um, I don't know what's happened to my brain, I just finished with this. Um, uh, um, uh, uh, it's, it really, it's time and space. It's chaos, chaos, earth. Love, Tartarus, I think Tartarus is, the, is it the fourth, Andre, do you remember? Uh, I don't quite remember. Do you have a theogony around? Uh, yeah. Somewhere in there. Yeah. I do think Tartarus is in there. Well, it is. Okay. Uh, but it's, let me see if I can, all right, Earth. I can't find it. I can't find it in my own. <laughs> Okay, uh, Earth, Sky, everything comes from the four, from those four. Um, and I'm not, I'm not, re okay. Um, okay, hunger, Earth, Tartarus, love. So love is fourth in Olson's retelling of it. And I'm trying to remember if it's fourth in Hesiod's. It's like there's a couple of lines right at the beginning of the, theo the, the, the theogony proper, right? Um, where you've got those four. So Tartarus is the absence of the womb inside of, right? And then earth is place to stand. Um, and love is what brings things together and begins to make the universe, right? Love. Love happens when there is a when a world there is a there's a possibility of a world rising up. So you have something to face and something to love, and then everything else comes from that. Then then you have you know Earth making heaven, and then she mates with heaven, and then all the rivers and the mountains are born and everything. It all takes place in about twelve lines of Hesiod. Have you got it there? Chaos, Gaia, Tartarus, Eros, Erebus. Nix night. So the first four would be chaos, Gaia, Tartarus, and Eros. Yeah, okay, so Tartarus is third in that, and, and, and love, Eros is, is fourth in the, in the sequencing of Hesiod. And with those categories, do you call those typologies? I'm trying to figure out how to understand that word. I'm sorry, what? Would those be considered typologies of uh, the theogony, those four categories, five categories that you're saying? I'm trying to figure out how to think about that word. Well, I think they're the preconditions for something rather than nothing, basically. I think it's the, I mean, the Greeks imagine things generating as humans procreate. So they had, it, they anthropomorphize, think earth and heaven mate together, you know, and make all these things. And then earth mates with other, other um, figures, but they're, they're um, personifications of, of really abstract entities. and. So what you get is 
well, there's a topology. It's it's a the it's an account of the world coming into being from chaos. It's an account of things arising, right? And the primacy of those four things where you've got um, chaos, which is, is uh, uh, first, right? And then you've got earth, which is some place, as opposed to no place. And Tartarus, which is absence, and then love, which would be the contrary, bring th bringing things into presence. And so that's a kind of precondition for making something. And then everything comes, the whole world comes, it appears, right? in its, all its features, its physical features and so on from there. And then the, the whole the story of Hesiod goes on to talk about the generation of the, the monsters. Right? There's a whole generation of monsters and the titans are born. Um, and then there's really three generations. There's the primordials, the, the, the elementals, I would, I would think of them as. So I would think of, of Chaos, um, Gaia, uh, Tartarus, and Eros as elementals. And then there's the giants and monsters. And then there is, out of the titans, uh, they come the Olympians. And the Olympians are humanoid. The most human looking. So, as I read it, it's a it's a story about huma the emergence of humanity, the emergence of a human uh, human face. Right? Um, and the central controversy in Hesiod is between the male and female deities. Oh, that's the story of of, um, of uh, Uranus being deposed by Cronos. Um, the castration of, of Uranus, and then um, Cronus again being deposed by Zeus. So why, what, like, what is the issue here? Interestingly, Gaia sides with her youngest until finally with Zeus, there's a kind of uh, detente, and she agrees that he can rule, right? So what, what is, what's the abstract way of saying that? You have the father gods, hmm? who want to continue, they want to stay in place, yeah. they want to continue to rule. And then you have the mother, the generating mother, because Gaia is always bringing forth, bringing forth, bringing forth, who favors her youngest. She always favors the first, right? So there's the, the, the poles of the tension are between continuity and change. Hmm? as opposed to good and evil. So it's like a horizontal axis in Hesiod as opposed to the Christian good and evil, which is a vertical axis. And um, they battled it out until the Olympians emerge. And, you know, I mean, Zeus, it, it, it's really, I can understand Olson's love of Hesiod because it's, a, it's an astonishing account. If you look at the, what, what Zeus does, huh? um, the way he, you know, makes deals. It's, it's very Machiavellian like, to bind the monsters, right? And to, you know, well, there's the River Styx, and gee, we have to do something with her because she's got a really old genealogy, you know, and she could challenge my throne. So let's give her something, you know? We'll make her the thing that the gods swear on, right? And then we'll get the hundred handers that the Titans put under, <clears throat> under, the, under the earth, and we'll, we'll liberate them, hmm? and uh, we'll get them to make us lightning bolts. And they'll have a job. Yeah. And then when we get you know, on the throne there, what we'll do is create a whole race of demigods, and they'll kill off the monsters. right? And they'll never be able to challenge me because they're only demigods. It's very clever. So um, I think the, the thing, though, the big lesson for me out of Hesiod was the, the central tension between continuity and change. Right? between wanting something, and essentially it's a story about the emergence of us, I, I don't have a better word than civilization, all that it doesn't make me very happy to say that, right? Um, human history huh? and the constant generation of the mother. You, you think about you know, the, the implications of every generation starting all over again from dot, right? No continuity, no history. Those are the poles, right? 
the generating mother, right? and the father gods who say, no, you know, I'm wanting to rule, I'm going to be, you know, I'm sitting on the throne and I'm going to stay here. Yeah. And uh, so those are the three generations. You move from the primordial, the elementals, to the giants and the monsters where the human race is not well defined and the species are not well defined, to the Olympians who, guess what, they look just like us. Yeah. And they stay. In other words, they have history. Sorry, that was more than once. No, that was fantastic. Can we go now? I'll, can I, I'll, I want to ask for just another repetition of something I wanted to hear again, if you sure, don't mind. Sure. Um, there were, it was in the last section, and there were two uh, points for me where you were talking about the special quality of poetry. Oh, yeah, okay. Form, and then yeah. also going to the allegory of richness in the world. Would you mind just going over those two sections? Okay. I have questions. I need to hear it. Uh, yeah, the, the special... Uh, the role of poetry. To see, um, you know, I can just summarize that for you, that it's really, um, that unlike other discourses that deal with statistics, right, and trends and large numbers, I'm suggesting that for Olson, um, the particular role of poetry was to, was to present the world in its particularities, right? And what that has to, what it has to mean is a revamping of the thing. And that's why I went off on that, that little tangent on thingness, right? And the, trying to get the, a different notion of the thing. Because if you just have an inert thing, then of course it's not liberating at all, right? You have to have a thing in its vivacity, in its liveness, right? Something that's other than you, that retains that otherness, that particularity, that specialness, right? So the absence as well as the presence. And Poetry, rather than, you know, the, well, philosophy or sociology or other discourses goes for that particularity. I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to make a general statement about all poetry in the world. I'm just kind of attempting to explicate Olson's point of view as, as, I, as I can come by it, huh? Right. Um, that, you know, that was the gold machine, right? Hmm. It's the gold machine. It's the poetic alchemy. You turn the world's things into the goal of poetry, you lift them up and, and make them visible and then you have a world to face. And that's what I mean by the beautiful. And then if you have a world to face, then the ethos follows from that. Okay. <laughs> Is that okay? Yeah, yeah, no, it's great. It's... I'm, still pr I'm still thinking about it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. In a good way. Yeah. Can I ask a follow-up question to that? Not so. Yeah, sure. Um, about beauty, so so I think I'm sort of understanding what you mean by beauty, but I'm just want because because you used the Kantian words in the beginning. Yeah, I yeah. Mm -hmm. Feel a little confused about like if it's the it's so if there's sort of beauty in the Kantian sense, what you're doing, the thing for itself, thing without thing before concept. Um, can you sort of like well the thing the thing lines? is not going to be equivalent with its concept that's that's it. that's the point so that you know if it if it is if the thing is perfectly equivalent with a the concept then you utterly possess it and there is not nothing in the world but but your mind that would be a perfect fit between mind and world and Olson wants to retain I think a sense of the strangeness or otherness of things and their possessive nature so I know I use the Kantian categories to begin with, and I know that's problematic. There's a lot to be said about, you know, the, how you can't separate the, the beautiful from the good or, or the useful. But I'd like to suggest that, that as a kind of operational way of thinking, right, rather than a very, uh, I don't mean my terms in a sort of absolute sense, that <clears throat> when you look at the world as form, as living form, you're not looking at it at the same time as an instrument that is a means to your end, right? Or 
as some kind of moral point. And that's why I wanted that bit on Ahab in there, right? So, the, the, I mean, the whale for Ahab is only good for two things. You, you know, either it's instrumental, it's a thing there to be used, right? Or it has to be a symbol. In, so, in other words, it's part of the universe of discourse. It, it belongs to the human, right? It's evil. Huh? <laughs> it, you chase the whale and kill it because it's evil. Moby Dick is evil, right? Well, the whole thing, the whole point of that story, and I think why Olson loved Melville so much, is that the whale is neither. I mean, it might be instrumentalized, and it might, you know, kill the people who hunt it. Is that evil? Well, not a hero Spinozan, but um, you know, <laughs> you, it, it's um, there. There is there is um, more to the whale. You can never completely say the whale, right? So to get form there with that kind of complexity, then that's what I'm saying. The world is beautiful because then you're addressing it. You're not simply eating it. Yeah. That's why all the mouth, like the, I love his thing with mouth without the will to eat, right? Well, why is there no world to eat? Because you've eaten it, silly, you know? I mean, there's nothing, there's nothing but apart from you and your ideas, right? And that, I mean, it works, it, it works as a kind of ecological metaphor, but it also works conceptually. That there's, that's what I was trying to say, there's the, the idea that when God is dead, there's nothing but us here. And anything else has to be a return to onto theology or religion or <coughs> mysticism, it's all mysticism or something. I'm resisting that conclusion. I'm saying that Olson is proposing, I think through Whiteheadian metaphysics, um, an alternative, you know, there's a materialism there um, that eludes us, escapes us. Um, and of course, you know, the beautiful is anthropomorphic, right? But it's also a decentering, it's the decentering that matters, the decentering that is radical. Right? I think that that's the part about Olson that I don't think. Um, gets enough airplay, how radical that decentering is. People say, oh, you know, he's epistemologically naive, or it's all anthropomorphic when you think about, you know, there's no such thing as unmediated experience, and, you know, this is a guy who wanted to get the shout back into language, and you can't really do that because language is system on and on and on, and so it goes, right? But I think that, that it's not about not being mediated. Of course, experience is mediated, perception is mediated by all kinds of things, huh? by language, by social position, by history, you know, by education, by where you are in the world, right? But it, it's not for that reason. We don't have to make ourselves the soul or center of the cosmos, is what I'm saying. It's a displacement, it's a decentering that he was after, as far as I can see. And that is where the beautiful comes in, because if you're not the center, then you see something else rising up. I think that's what the poem The Ring Up is about. You know, she rose from the genital wave, and um, the, the, the birth of Venus, the coming into presence of the world, um, as in Hesiod. Yeah. Um, thank you so much. I um, am completely uh, enchanted and intrigued by your, by your methodology um, for talking about Olson and, and, and and how you work through um, these poets in radical affection. So I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about that um, in your your just your your way of, your your method of, of you know by using um, um, this by, by going through systematically um, or using the, the history of skepticism and, and rational response to approach. Mm. Well, I think I'm just resisting an epistemological reading. Mm -hmm. Um, because that reading is always going to erase experience, you know? You can always show that experience is determined to some, to, to maybe a great extent. And that's really what I was after in that I wanted to try to give, I, I wrote that book for myself. I wanted to know what I thought. And so I needed to kind of write about these poets that I'd lived alongside of in books for, for a long time. And I also thought that, that the best way to read them was not through 
the, the, the given critical discourses. That that's, was what was driving me in that. Um, and so what I needed to show with using Olson in the first part of that book as a kind of ground was that was that you you didn't need to take perception as or his views of perception as being unmediated. In fact, it, it, in a sense, he assumed what later critics had to labor away at and show as you know um, as a, as a, um, epistemologically kind of suspect or something, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, I mean, that's why I wanted to focus on special view of history, because I think that's where he really says, you know, this is like, wh what, is, what goes into anything in the world, any person or, or animal or organism, right? Um, it really is, has to do with the, um, the genetic history, huh? And the biosocial history uh, is what I said. Biosocial history, the all all its genetic information, all its all its species history, all its personal history, right? plus its circumstances, right? and then its agency, because the agency is the response to that. So, there the agency is never total. Right? But it's not erased either, and that was another thing that drove that book, mm -hmm. that we need to get a sense of agency back, right? a, a way to talk about agency um, without having to be, uh, to, to uh, I don't know, apologize for it, mm -hmm. in a sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I'd like to really plug your book. Uh, <laughs> I think it should be required reading for anyone doing great work in post-American poetry. Uh, it's a beautiful book and eminently useful, and I, uh, what I see in it is something that's been needed for a long time, is something of a bridge. I suspect, actually, it's what I've understood, you can know that a lot comes through Blazer. I think it's yeah, your immersion yeah. in Blazer. He sort of, it was there in him, but you brought it out. But you build a bridge, really, between what you call projective verse, or you know, New American poetry on one hand, and then this beast known as French theory, and beyond French theory, uh, mm -hmm. continental philosophy. Mm -hmm. You're really the first, I think, to pull that together. Uh, that whole picture together. And a lot of grad students are asking, what is French theory? What is projective verse? And you're mm -hmm. sort of saying, well, oh, take a look. Here's how these things sound. Mm -hmm. okay. mm -hmm. it, it really is an amazing book. Oh, well, thanks. Thanks, Andre. I really appreciate mm -hmm. your comments. Second. Thing. I pre appreciate that. Yeah. So, Mary, can you, can you talk a little bit about abstraction <coughs> in the terms that you set up? Mm -hmm. when, when you first set up? I started about, yeah, the abstraction, because Okay, the, the thing about abstraction, you know, I started with the story of the Essex, right? <clears throat> what I'm suggesting is that what happens at the physical level in the story of the Essex, that is eating, the, the cannibalism, right? The Essex crew, the crew of the Essex is a real event, right? Um, so they're set adrift and they, they are starving and they have to eat each other, right? That is a horrible, horrible thing. And I, I don't think that you can't. You don't fault people for that, right? But the the way that it, it prefaces "Call Me Ishmael," there's a conceptual level at which the cannibalism cannibalism happens, and that's Ahab. What I'm calling Ahab and Ahabian man, right? So that how that cannibalism takes place at the conceptual level is you've got Ahab with his one idea. <laughs> right, and he takes this Pequod, which is a you know everybody knows is like a little mini America with every possible race and creed and language and you know and one idea, <coughs> all of you are bound to that one idea, and all the differences are erased and the and the particularities are erased, and Ahab in that way consumes his crew. So I'm saying that at that level he's culpable as the Essex people are not. Like, why did Olson preface Call Me Ishmael with the story of the Essex? Right? He, didn't, he didn't need to really do that if he just wanted to speak about Noby Dick, right? But I think that that story of cannibalism is a way of, of creating an analogy with um, conceptual cannibalism, where the abstractions, and that's why I went to the 
uh, you know, the, um, his remarks in Auschwitz, the intolerable way to Auschwitz is to reduce everything to an obsession, to an idea. And how do you not do that? Well, you create the thing in its complexity and its processiveness. And that's what I'm calling the beautiful, right? That yeah, yeah. you get, you have to, you, that's why the thing has to have dimensionality. Because if it's only inert, you can just gobble it up conceptually. You know, it fits the idea and that's it. You're done with it. Mentally, you've just consumed it. I don't remember that. I don't remember the context of the whole thing, but I remember something that Blazer said in that interview that we did in 1999, which is that the greatest violence is abstraction. Uh, yeah. Abstraction. Yeah, the, the, the violence of language. You talk, but, I mean, language is always already an abstraction. Of course it is, right? Um, so that's why you kind of need a poet, you know, to, to, to play around with it. You need the gold machine to, to make the language dance in a way that it is not immediately consumable. So the consumption is going on at the intellectual level, just as at the physical level. And I believe that Olson uses the physical level to illustrate, I think, what may be the more serious and common condition, which is the intellectual level. And I read the, the Nerval poem at the end, because that to me is about intellectual consumption. You know, So the universe is absent from all your plants. Why? Because there's only your mind, right? There's only your mind on the earth. And of course, everything else, because it's filtered through your mind, I think people can, the, the basic confusion is between anthropomorphism, which is inevitable, and that's the epistemological point, and anthropocentrism, which is not inevitable, right? The centrality. So, of course, beauty is anthropomorphic. It, that's not an issue. Of course, it's mediated. But you make it rise up in its otherness, in its fact that it's not you, right? And then you have something to address. So then mouth has something to say. That's where love comes in, right? Then you have something to love rather than just gobble up. So that was a... <laughs> yeah? Um, this is fabulous. And I'm really intrigued by this idea of consumption. Yeah. Particularly with thinking about it in a, can in a cannibalistic way, in a way consumption or lack thereof. This yeah. is a sort of defining factor of humanity, yeah. um, conceptually at least. And I think I'm thinking about um, Haraway's idea of consumption, um, where humans and animals can partake, can eat together, and that can be a form of communication as well. So sort mm -hmm. of not troubling, that's a more negative word than I want to use, but sort of breaking down that like human-centric barrier versus the cannibalism which aims to support it. And I'm wondering mm -hmm. if the sort of varied modes of consumption um, could bring, in your opinion, could bring some more to bear on the anthropomorphism and the anthropocentrism. And yeah, I, I don't know, I'm, I'm still trying to understand. You'll never, you'll never, get, you'll never get rid of mouth. That's, that's just the way the world is, right? That's mm -hmm. like Shelley said, that's the triumph of life. You won't get away from that ever. But what you can do eh, is stop chewing for a minute. <laughs> um, I mean, that you have, everything is, you know, the Jains understand this, right? And Jainism, I'm not a Jainist, I'm not proposing Jainism at all, but that is a, a, um, an Indian sect that understands the consequences. Everything eats everything else. On the, and so that's going to go on. But it doesn't have to be blind or to be done in a way that says, well, I mean, there's nothing else there but food for me, right? So you then begin to ha kind of have a dialogue with the world and, yeah, you're probably going to eat part of it. Huh? <laughs> but you, you don't have to, um, you don't have to blindly consume. I don't know if there's, I mean, there's no cure for life <laughs> in that way. I mean, the cure is death, right? <laughs> yeah. 
Um, along those lines, I'm really intrigued by the stuff that's in your in your Olson essay in the book about um, Olson's about ecology and yeah. the closest um, scientific counterpart to Olson's project. And you call out the kind of contemporary systems that contribute to the, this making obsolete yeah, death. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, yeah. I was when the thing that you said towards the end of your paper about um, about technology and how technology you suspect that it's not something about how it's not being used any better now than it was. Yeah, I wonder if you could comment on the relationship between like, this making obsolete of death and mm -hmm, maybe like our contemporary sure. moment with technology. Well, I mean, technology is an extension of the will, hmm? mm -hmm. and and so it's like a human prosthetic. It <laughs> it, it, it extends our reach way beyond our bodies, yeah. and it's very fast and very efficient. Now, I you know what the image that comes to mind. I I did some. Um, courses in, in Quebecois history at the University of Montreal, and our teacher showed us a um, uh, film called uh, Le Heure Boyal, or the, the Air of the Forest, and, and in, so things I never, I'd never seen before. Um, the Quebec forests had been ravaged uh, by big corporations and so on. Now, they have something, I, I'm sure that you know, this is not news to the logging industry, but machines that come in and without, it's not loggers, you know, kind of hacking the forest primeval. It is machines that clip the trunk and then strip the, the branches so fast, you know, that you've got a, a log in like no time and they can just move through a forest like this, right? So that extends the reach. If you think about the difference between that and the, the you know, Cour de Bois <laughs> out there, you know, with his axe <laughs> and uh, you know maple syrup, um, it's a huge extension of of the will to cut down the forest. And we can do these things. Um, we can extend our our will and wish over the planet totally now. And if we don't, you know, I, the, the the conquest of death is part of it. It's part of the pharmaceutical, the amazing pharmaceutical industry. I mean, look at us, right? Uh, you know, um, if this were er earlier generations, we, we, would, we would all be looking much worse than we do now. <laughs> Don't you think? Or we'd be dead. I would certainly be dead, you know? <laughs> In my grandmother's generation, I would be dead by now because I wouldn't have the medical care and the vitamins and the this and the that and the injections and the creams and the, you know, all of that stuff. And so, yeah, the conquest of death, the conquest of the planet. All I'm saying is that it, it, I'm not anti-tech per se, but it can be, it, when it's used thoughtlessly, it, it, it increases the suffering in the world. And that I object, to, I do object to. Increases the suffering of subaltern populations that bear the burden, for example, of climate change, right? Or the um, you, there, there, are, there are places in the world that you know you try the whole environmental justice movement, where you know you have places that are dumping grounds, and they're usually poor places, and people don't live as long there because they breathe bad air, <coughs> and they drink bad water, and they have bad earth, you know. Um, so that. Is what I meant by the uh, what I think of as a careless, anthropocentered use of technology. I, I would also say that it's anthropocentric to think that a space that doesn't have human habitation in it or on it, it has nothing there, right? The Earth is always totally full all the time, you know. There, there's. Molecules are busy everywhere. There's no vacuum, um, but we tend to think that if we're not building something on it or doing something with it or eating it or that it, there's nothing there. Uh, it's that's what I meant by by um, technology pushing the borders. It extends our our instrumentalizing of things. You know, it doesn't have to. But that's often the way it's used, um, and it does increase suffering for some. <laughs> you're, Hi. You're speaking a bit earlier about this is taking things in a different direction.
direction, but about sequencing in terms of the story of the Essex. Yeah. yeah. Um, can you speak a little bit about um, the, the, the poetic emphasis falling where it does? In, the, in, in Olson's work? Yeah. Well, I don't, I, I think that it looks like, it looks like the history comes, it's not true. I mean, there's history all the way through the Maximus poems, there's myth all the way through the Maximus poems, but maybe there's more history at the beginning than there is at the end. And I think that maybe the reason for that is that Olson began to, you know, he wanted to activate the gold machine. He wanted to make myth, because why myth? Because myth is a way of giving the earth agency. It acknowledges that things that are not human, um, you know, tell stories about them and lets us talk, talk to them or address them. So in the last part of my poem, I'm saying, well, you know, every generation has to reinvent the world for itself. That is, the old names, the old myths that maybe Olson raised, you know, the earth is not going to answer to that anymore. But the point is to give it agency, to give it life, to have a conversation with it, you know. That's why the myth of Poesis, and I think that maybe um, became more pressing huh? um, as the, uh, all the uh, Maximus poems rolled on. Huh? Um, that amazing Max, uh, Maximus one to Dogtown, you know, it's really participation mystique, the whole world, like earth and heaven, you know, and Hesiod are mating, and the fishermen are mating, and <laughs> the dark and everything is moving together, and oh, yes. <laughs> it is really cool. So, <laughs> um, yeah, I think that that, a way to, 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 to um, it became important to address the cosmos. You know, Ralph Maud to Olson moves from history to cosmos, or polis, the human polis in the beginning to cosmos. That's a generalization that you can poke holes in. It's pretty easy to do that. But I think that to be able to address the world in its, its world, worldliness, um, he used myth for that. That's why it became important. <laughs> Amy, I'm sorry. I didn't. Oh, um, I've, I was going to ask about, I think of the beautiful as in Burke, a counterpoint to the sublime. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah, and, absolutely. Yeah. Right. And I, but I think of the sublime as what holds that temporal weight and that temporal kind of um, urgency. Mm -hmm. uh, like uh, Clay's Angelus Nobilus, right, is, is like the sublime. It's that sense mm -hmm. of sublimity of like that which came before, like weighing on the present. And Something that I always think of the sublime as the, as the, the category that holds temporal fluidity um, and temporal sort of accessibility more so than the beautiful, which is kind of what I'm trying to adjust to. Yeah. Well, yeah. okay. So this, if if you want if you want that kind of language, then the sublime is is going down to the bottom mm. of nature, right? It's the thing that flows, right? Whereas the poet is the magician that makes the forms rise up. Hmm. So the beautiful, right? Hmm. And of course it's illusion. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right? But but then the al the alternative is 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 to just unconsciously, you know, what Bataille said, you're like water in water. Right? Mm -hmm. And we're we are already creatures who've been turned around to face the earth. Uh, um, so um, we we can't go like you know, your dog and cat, like water and water, right? We have to say, so, so the sublime, if you're actually in this, if you were lost in the sublime, you would be, you would be formless mm -hmm. and flowing. Right? You would be in the cosmos, not looking at the cosmos. And there's good reason, I think, to have us look at the cosmos. That is, look at it as the beautiful thing. Right? for the reasons I've tried to outline. What, um, I'm sorry, is this published or this is something that you've recently... Oh, this is, I mean, this is just kind of a twerking on stuff I did and radical affections, you know? Okay, I wanted to emphasize this, what I didn't do in radical, I, I went after a special view of history 
in that Olson chapter, but the, and this one I wanted to talk about the later Maxim's poems because I, I wanted to worry the idea of mythopoiesis as being sort of a dead art, you know? I wanted to try to say, well, mythopoiesis it serves these certain functions in Olson, and maybe for contemporary writers it's not going to serve those functions, but we need to find other methods, right? That is, other names to call the earth. You, um, you sort of evolve into this incredible, beautiful poem at the end of that that like hit me like a ton of bricks, <laughs> and I would love to read it over and over again. Um, <laughs> or, or, but I don't want to make you read it again. It's, right now. Inter- it's, it's in. Um, Do you have it? Yeah, oh, it, it's Ver- yeah. It's Ro- Robin's translation of Verdor, Nerval's Verdor, the Golden Poem. Um, which really is a, it is a very beautiful poem and astonishingly prescient. Uh, to me, it's a, quite a contemporary poem, you know, because the whole of Les Chimeres deals with the death of the death of the gods. The gods are popping off all over the place in that series, one after t'other, right? <laughs> and then you get to the golden poem and it just slays me. It says, yeah, well, you know, the universe is absent from all your plans. Well, it went very well following the yeah. conversation about, you know, about technology and yes. this sort of yes. trajectory that we're on. Yeah, that seemed to be, I, that's why I wanted to put it there, even though it kind of looks, it's a bit weird to put a blazer poem at the end of an Olsen essay, but I thought that the Verdor was um, addressed what I tried to say right at the end there. Well, I'm cooked. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs>